Mr. Armstrong has been talking quite a lot recently. You've noticed it in the mail you've been receiving. And you also should have noticed it in both the films. And I was sitting there next to Mr. White both last night and, and uh, this morning kind of jiving him a little bit and kidding with him on my behalf. I said, Mr. Armstrong is stealing my scriptures. He's stealing my scriptures. Uh, he's talking about a subject that I've been thinking about for a long time. A lot of us in the ministry joke with each other about that because sometimes you get a special emphasis you'd like to bring in your sermon and someone else sort of steals your thunder a little bit. Mr. Armstrong's been talking about the church being prepared for the marriage of Jesus Christ, and he emphasized that both last night and this morning. And I've been thinking a lot about that recently, and I think Mr. Armstrong didn't really steal my thunder at all, but rather gave, I hope, what will be a very effective an appropriate lead-in for maybe some of the things that will be said throughout the course of this festival in bringing to your attention the awareness of just how ready we have to be. I don't know since you've begun to hear the thought, and it's not a new thought at all, that the church is to be married to Christ in an analogy, but I wonder if you've given a little more attention in the last few weeks or months since we've been talking about that a little bit more about just what kind of a bride is Christ going to accept when he comes. Because, you see, you and I collectively and all our brethren that will be part of the church when Christ comes, born and raised, uh, ra born into God's family, raised from the dead, are going to be part of the bride. It will be a tremendous and exhilarating experience for us to be part of that fantastic ceremony that is going to take place. But what kind of a bride is Christ going to accept? Just any old body? You think Christ is kind of desperate to get married? You know, a lot of young men get desperate. When they aren't married, maybe they're 23, 25, 28, or 30, and then they get desperate. Young women do, too, of course. And then they marry just any old body, it seems like. It doesn't work out when you do that. You've got to be married to just the right person to have the right kind of a marriage and to have the happiness that marriage is intended to bring us in this life. Do you think Christ is going to marry some old, behaggered woman that hadn't prepared herself? Hasn't been thinking about the marriage, just go out on the street and say, hey, will you marry me? Well, I don't think you think that's what Christ's going to do, and I sure want to tell you today that that's not what he's going to do. He's not going to marry anything that comes along. And I'll tell you something else about Christ. He's not desperate. You know how long he's been waiting for us to be married to us? A very, very long time. We're going to be talking about that. Christ is very patient, and that bride is going to have to be just right. And if we're not ready, and we aren't part of what's right, he won't marry us. He's not going to accept us just like we are, but he's given us some standards to measure up to. He's been telling us even more recently, fired through God's servants, what's expected of us and how we're going to have to be prepared. Christ is very selective about who he's going to marry. You know, in one sense of the word, this is Christ's second time around for marriage. He was married once before. It didn't work out too good when Christ was married once before. It wasn't the kind of a marriage that he's going to have for eternity, and the fault was not his. The first marriage did not succeed. In the Old Testament, I think you know that Jesus Christ was the one who became, or was beforehand, Jesus Christ became the Son of God through the birth of the Virgin Mary. But he wasn't the Old Testament, the Yahweh, the Eternal. He was the Lord in the Old Testament, the one through whom we read much of the Old Testament uh, introduced to as the personage of God. And in an analogy in the Bible, if you want to be turning to Ezekiel 16, we find the marriage that took place there, oh, 34, 3,500 years ago or so, a long, long time ago, when the marriage was prepared and the analogy that we'll be drawing from this. Now bear in mind as I go through the sermon today, we're, we're giving an analogy of marriage. You need to understand it in that context. Not every last little application can be drawn in an analogy, but we get the overall picture of what's going to occur. We're going to see as we read through Ezekiel 16 here in a minute, what we might expect. You know, uh, I ask what kind of a bride will Christ accept? Well, what kind of a husband do you, the bride, expect. What kind of a husband do you want him to be? What do you think he will be like? We can know in advance what he's going to be like because we can find what kind of a husband he was. He hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, he's not some different kind of person. 
He didn't treat the first woman bad, but then I'll treat the second woman good. He isn't going to show some kind of favoritism. He's had a very interesting experience with this marriage that he took place that took place. We can find out from reading Ezekiel 16 the kind of a husband Christ is. I think we can also find out what kind of wife he expects. And we might dream by reading through the chapter two what kind of a marriage it's going to be like. What will its conditions be? The allegory begins in verse one of chapter sixteen. The word of the Lord came unto me, this is Ezekiel. Son of man, confront Jerusalem with her detestable practices and say to her, this is what the eternal God says. Now, the city of Jerusalem becomes representative of the nation of Israel, the capital, and it is an analogous now to a woman. She takes on the personality in this literary license of the poet again, of the prophet, to give to us a picture of what it was like. He says to her, your ancestry and your birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. And on the day that you were born, your cord was not cut, nor you were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloth. Here we go way back to her infancy as a nation. And she was like a child that no one was willing to take care of. No one wanted a cast off, destitute child. Someone was just willing to put away in poverty and hope somebody else would take care of, but the real parent didn't want to. So Christ appears on the scene and says toward the end of verse 5, on the day that you were born, you were despised. Then he said, then I passed by. I passed by and I saw you kicking about in the blood. As you lay there in your blood, I said unto you, having great compassion on this new little infant nation, struggling, rejected, cast apart, and he said as he picked this little infant up and held it, he said, live, live. I will make you grow like a plant of the field. And sure enough, like a little child grows to maturity and then into young ladyhood, I, you grew and you developed and you became the most beautiful of jewels. Your breasts were formed and your hair grew, you who were naked and bare. And all of a sudden, in this analogy, Christ is like the personages of a loving older man who takes this infant and out of love and kindness to it, nurtures and cares for it and provides for it. But you know, little children grow up and sometimes they grow up so very rapidly. And all of a sudden, even we as parents and certainly other adults who maybe not seeing someone for a while really notice this and we see someone some years later, all of a sudden they've grown up, as it were, right before our very eyes. And like so many parents experience, when their teenage daughter begins into puberty, you, you take them down to the orthodontist and you slap the braces on their teeth. It seems at that time, for some reason, their hair all comes down and hangs half over their face. And somewhere in there are two little eyes of this little teeny bopper with the braces and the pimply face that breaks out. And all of a sudden, three or four years go by and the braces come off and the hair has been nicely done and the pimples of the blemishes have dried up. And all of a sudden... Many of you parents have experienced this before your very eyes. It's a beautiful young lady out of this little teeny bopper with pimples and braces and hair covering her face. You just are so shocked by it sometimes. My wife was just telling me on the phone, my family's in Tucson, by the way, waiting for me. My daughter's a graduating senior in high school this year, and my wife was just so excited about her graduation pictures. You know, you, in our school there, you have to go to a professional photographer and uh, get your senior pictures taken. The other classes don't. And, my wife said the photographer has just really captured what the personality of our daughter is, Rhonda. And I'm so anxious to see the pictures, even though I see her every day. There's something about the specialty of the event, isn't there? That the young lady is now a young lady, and she's not just a kid anymore. She's going to graduate from high school. And there's something special we parents feel about our children when they turn into the 17 and 18 year old. We start thinking about the time they're going to be out on their own. I'm very anxious, of course, to get down there. Not only to see my daughter, but for some reason I want to see a picture. A crazy kind of an experience, but those are the emotions we have. Well, I think that's kind of the way Christ in this analogy was. He said, all of a sudden, there you were, a fully developed, mature young lady, and you were beautiful, strikingly beautiful. And verse 8, later I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. And I gave you my solemn oath. And I entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord Eternal, and you became mine. Israel was married to Christ. He saw in the analogy the nation blossom forth 
as they entered into the promised land from those years of wandering in the wilderness with their tousled hair and their straggly, unshaven faces and their clothes that had not even worn out during those 40 years, but nevertheless the only ones they had, all of a sudden the nation bloomed as it got into the land. God blessed and prospered it. And in the analogy, Christ is liking that to this young lady that grows up right before his very eyes that he's sort of been taken care of as a foster parent almost, but now he realizes she's ravishingly beautiful, well cared for, and hopefully in a right attitude. And so he takes her as his wife. And Christ entered in to a covenant with Israel as they wandered through that desert and entered into the promised land. They became, as it were, married. And the great eternal God married this nation of Israel. Verse 9, I bathed you with water and I washed the blood from you and put ointments upon you. This goes in retrospect now to how she developed from this unwanted, rejected little urchin child into this most beautiful bride, now the wife of the Christ. And he said, verse 10, now you wonder what kind of a husband he is. He's going to tell you a little bit about it. I clothed you with an embroidered dress and I put leather sandals on you. I dressed you in fine linen and I covered you with costly garments. He really loved her, and he had the ability to provide the very best for his bride. And for her, this most beautiful jewel, none but the best would do. I think every woman reading this verse would say, My, my, if we, we had the ability, I hope my husband would be this way to me. And really, I hope all of you husbands are this way, according to your ability. This does not mean you would have to buy the same kind of jewel Christ would provide. But you can provide a way and a thought process, which is even more important. He said, I put bracelets on your arms and necklaces upon your neck, and I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head, because to Christ, beautiful young Israel was like a stately queen, almost too beautiful again. She was so strikingly, outstandingly beautiful that she became his queen. Mr. Armstrong, I think, has thought very much that way of his wife 50 years, and I'm sure very much that way about his wife now. Because he is the kind of a man that I think reflects this kind of personality, and he has always so honored and revered his wife. Set a marvelous example for us. And he said, You were ador- adorned with gold and silver, and your clothes were of fine linen and costly fabric and embroidered cloth. Your food was fine flour and honey and olive oil, and you became very beautiful, and you rose to be a queen. And your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty, because the splendor I had given you made your beauty perfect. I wonder if sometimes any of you husbands ever tell your wives they're perfect. Well, maybe none of us physically is perfect, but this is the kind of love Christ had for Israel. This is the way Christ feels about his bride. And like I said earlier, he doesn't change. When he marries us, if we've qualified and are part of it, this is how he's going to look at us. And this is an eternal provision that you and I can look forward to if we make it, that I made you perfect in beauty. But now a strange thing happens, unfortunately, because Israel does not respond to the love that Christ gives her and the provision he gives her. She accepts it all and wears it regally. But in the course of time, it seems to all go to her head. And this once beautiful marriage collapses, collapses around the very creator being who made it all possible. You trusted in your beauty, and you used your fame and became a prostitute. You lavished your favors on anyone who passed by, and your beauty became his. You took some of your garments and made gaudy high places where you carried on your prostitution. Such things should not happen, nor should they ever be done. You also took the fine jewelry I gave you, and you made jewelry of gold and silver and made for yourself idols, and you engaged in prostitution with them. And you took your embroidered clothes to put on them, and you offered my oil and incense before them. Also, the food I provided for you, the fine flour and oil and honey I gave you to eat, you offered a fragrant incense before them. That's what happened, declares the Lord Eternal. Can you imagine such a thing? This woman cast out in her blood to die as an infant child, rejected of her parents, but now given everything possibly needed in life, turns on the very one who gave it all and who provided it, and who had sustained her life lo these years, having entered into this marriage contract and virtually bestowed upon her queenship. And she used the riches, the beauty, 
that she had for others. That's what Israel did to Christ, and Christ became the rejected husband of ancient Israel. In verse 22, he said, In all your detestable practices and your prostitution, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare and kicking about in blood. And that great being, Yahweh, had to look upon that beautiful woman now turned wrong, now having stepped aside, having violated the sacred marriage covenant that they had entered into, and had to watch her reject every good thing that had been given, and had to let her go her own way. Had to let her go. Now, what did Christ do? Become desperate? He was angry, and he was hurt. And he handed to Israel, as it were, a bill of divorcement. But he didn't rush out to try to find another bride. He was a married man, and he was committed to the marriage. And it was not he who made the marriage fall apart. It was not he who took it to pieces. It was not he who washed it down. But it was he who had to stand and take it all, and through it all, stand faithful. He never once looked at another woman. And he never once went out and tried to enter into a married relationship with another woman. He didn't shift over to the Amalekites or the Amorites or the Hivites or the Hittites or the Jebusites or the Babylonians or the Assyrians or the Egyptians or the Chaldeans or anybody else. Never, not a minute, did he even entertain the thought. He was a married man, and he was committed to his bride in spite of what she did. Angry and allowed her to learn the lesson that had to be learned in order for this marriage to once again someday be made right. But he did finally enter into a divorce and put her away, but not rushing out to remarry. The wife broke the covenant, and so in verse 59 of this chapter, sometimes read through the entire chapter because there's a lot more in it, that will give you some idea of this marital relationship that has taken place. But in verse 59, this is what the eternal Lord says, I will deal with you as you deserve because you have despised my oath by breaking my covenant. Yet I will remember the covenant I made with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. You see, Christ knows who he wants to marry, and he's waited for her to get right. He's waited for her to get right as we count time, what, 30, 3,000 or whatever years. A long time, a good solid 3,000 years. He's been waiting for her to get right. Then he said, then I will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your sister, both those who are older and those who are younger. You have to read the rest of the chapter to get some of that analogy. I will give them to you as daughters, but not on the basis of my covenant with you. So I will establish my covenant with you, verse 62, and you will know that I am the eternal. Then when I make atonement for you, for all you have done, you will remember and be ashamed, and you'll never again open your mouth because of the humiliation, declares the Lord eternal. An atonement was to be made. Now, that marriage to Christ was, I mean, to, the, to Israel was some 14, 1,500 years before Jesus Christ appeared on the scene as a physical flesh and blood human being. And then Yahweh, the spokesman of God, the eternal, as revealed in the Old Testament, became a human being, born himself of a virgin, a tiny infant child, gave up the divinity that he had possessed as a member of God's family, became human, mortal, as a human being. Technically, though, Christ was still a married man. He'd entered into that covenant 1,400 years before as a nation, and even though the covenant had been violated by the woman, he remained faithful and true. I don't know if this is a part of the reason that Jesus Christ did not marry as a physical human being. I'm sure there's much more to it than that. But I would at least speculate that one of the reasons was he was a married man. You know what annuls the marriage contract, what annuls the marriage covenant, is death. There had been no death. Israel was still alive. Christ was still alive. Even though he had emptied himself of divinity, he possessed life. He had not died, and the contract seemed valid. I'm sure there are many other reasons that Christ did not marry a physical human being while he was on this earth, but as I said, maybe speculatively, this could be a small part of the reason. But of course, after 33 and a half years, Christ did die. He did die, and he died for many reasons. 
many, many things are accomplished and consummated in the death of Jesus Christ, but something rather significant also occurred. The annulment, the forfeiture, the cancellation of the marriage contract with Israel then obviously took place. You see, the husband now was dead, and the marriage was essentially over at that point. And then, of course, Christ was raised from the dead. But you know, in his heart of hearts, when he died, he was not dying to make himself free from the covenant so he could now go out and choose a new wife. He had not in the divorce proceedings of the Old Testament ever accepted a new wife. And even in the preparation for the death, he did not, he did not intend to marry someone else. Let's read verse 63 again. Then when I make atonement for you, for all you have done, you will remember and be ashamed and never again open your mouth because of your humiliation. Israel, when Christ died for her, he died for her to repent of her sins and to have a way to forgive her for her prostitution and harlotry and her idolatry and all the way she had gone. What a husband Jesus Christ is. A love so far transcending and superseding anything we human beings have that he was willing to die for the marriage, but not to be free from it, not to be free for her and him to both go their separate ways in a resurrection even, but to be dying for her to be forgiven for her sins so that the eternal contract could be made. He wants her to repent, to change her way so she can be forgiven and enter into an eternal contract. Now let's see what's happening in the New Testament as the death of Christ has occurred and Christ looks through this in some of the prophecies and the statements of the New Testament ministry. In Matthew chapter 21, Christ was dealing with the representatives of the Israelites while he was a physical human being, some of the Jewish leaders of the day, and he said, verse 42, a very interesting scripture, he said unto them, Have you never read in the scriptures, it's Matthew 21, 42, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in his eyes. See, there was an analogy drawn between the ancient great pyramid that had been built that never had a capstone put on it because apparently the designer and architect of it, Khufu or Cheops, the Egyptian who built it, did not accept the workmanship on the capstone that was to be raised up to the top of the pyramid. And as the historians have at least analyzed it, there apparently never was a capstone on the top of the pyramid. It just goes up near the top, and what should have been the final stone apparently was never placed on it. And it becomes sort of a permanent spiritual analogy, that great landmark in Egypt, to pass through time, and Christ is even using it to draw spiritual analogy because he himself becomes representative of the capstone, you see. And the builders are now rejecting it. The leaders of the nation to which he had come to bring the truth are despising and rejecting him. And he says, therefore, verse 43, I tell you that the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce fruit. And Christ was building the very foundation of that people right before their very eyes. Because they rejected him, he selected 12 men whom he called his apostles. And through the apostles, built upon the foundation of the prophets in the Old Testament and the apostles and friends and uh, servants of his throughout time, he was going to build his church. Jesus said in Matthew 16, we won't need to turn to it, you're very familiar with the scripture, he said, I will build my church. So the New Testament church becomes the people to whom the kingdom of God is given. That is the message of and the opportunity for the kingdom of God. And ancient Israel, the physical nation who had been given custodianship of the law of God, the way of God, and entered into the marriage contract, but who went astray and did not continue in faithfulness, is now having it taken from them and given to a nation who would produce fruit with it. And Christ, of course, commissioned that church to do just that, to take the gospel to the world and to bear fruit. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, 1 Peter 2, 9, some of these will be very familiar scriptures to you, and I'll get to some in a moment that won't be maybe so familiar to you. You may not have read for a while on this subject. 
1 Peter 2, 9, speaking of the church, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So to the church that Peter was part of the foundation of some years before he wrote this letter, he writes of them, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And so the church in the New Testament becomes spiritual Israel. Not really different, not really different, but spiritual Israel because the contract was made with Israel. Now something is happening to it. In Romans chapter 2, we see what is expected of it and how this is effected. And that it, is not, it does not just become a matter of racial inheritance or of nationality or of where you were born, but rather what you become. But it is Israel upon whom Christ bestows his love. But it does not turn out to be that Israel remains just the physical geographical people who in the Old Testament time were the bride, the nation of Israel at all. It is expanded into spiritual depth. Romans 2, verse 28. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code, such as a man's praise is not from men but of God. So we find through the writings of the Apostle Paul that what happens in the New Testament is that we each, out of all nations and peoples of racial extraction, are called to a knowledge of the way of God and through the Spirit of God are made spiritually Israel. It's still Israel, though. You become an Israelite in spirit, whatever your national heritage might be. And it is not a matter of physical fleshly birth and genealogy. It is a matter of what is in your heart, the call of God to the intention of becoming part of that group that can become spiritual Israel to whom Christ is once again going to enter into a marriage contract. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 29 God described this ancient nation of Israel to whom he had entered into this marriage contract. Here is what he saw in them and what he so desperately longed for. Verse 29 of Deuteronomy 5. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and to keep my commandments always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Oh, that there were such an heart in them. But there wasn't. When she got famous, beautiful, mature, rich, respected, it all went to her head. She knew she was beautiful. She knew from her husband she had derived great wealth. And rather than love and to respect and to sanctify that, she polluted all that was given her. Her beauty and her wealth became her downfall. And God cried out to her, Oh, that there were such an heart that she would respect and love and obey. Now in the New Testament church, Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, there now is a great difference from the time Christ came to die for the sins of man and ascend to the heavens after the resurrection and to send the Holy Spirit back down to the earth for you and me, which we read about on the Feast of Pentecost some weeks back in the early part of the summer when we observed that festival. Mr. Armstrong even very briefly explained this morning on the film. But in Romans 5 and verse 5, we read about how spiritually it's going to be different now. In the Old Testament, God longs for and agonizes that Israel doesn't have the heart to obey and to keep the way and to mean, maintain the sacredness of the covenant. But now verse 5 of Romans 5, and hope does not disappoint us because God has, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which he has given us. God has provided something for you and for me ancient Israel didn't have, because you see, Christ is going to be very careful this time. There will be no bad marriage this time. This time the bride will not turn in pollution to idolatry and to prostitution, to filth and lewdness. She will not. It will be assured before the marriage, and it will be assured by the shedding in your hearts of God's Holy Spirit and sealed with redemption when you are born into the very family of God. So God has sent his Holy Spirit 
Now, I'd like to go to the scripture Mr. Armstrong read both last night and this morning, if you don't mind hearing it one more time, and maybe someone will even choose to bring it back another time or two before the feast is out. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, where we find out what's ahead for you who are spiritual Israelites, because you are the continuation of that group of people that Christ commissioned as a holy nation and a royal priesthood to do the job, to carry out the mission, and to become part of that collective body that would be spiritual Israel that would enter into this great wedding ceremony. Revelation 19 and verse 6. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud claps of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. This is, in a vision that John saw, the return of Christ to the earth. And it is event number one in priority of what's going to happen, even before you see the descent of Christ occurring in the 11th verse and so on, which probably went through on the day of trumpets for one of the sermons. But here John sees in vision a great heavenly host, an angelic choir, singing, praising, hallelujah to God. The Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Why? Because one of the most important events in all eternity is about to take place. The wedding of the Lamb has come. The bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given unto her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. The church has been prepared. I don't know if you caught Mr. Armstrong's emphasis or not. I imagine you did. He emphasized very positively and assuredly, confidently, the church will make herself ready. We don't have to say, maybe, or we sure hope that, or it would be good. Well, there's not too much chance the church is going to be ready. It's not the way Mr. Armstrong is. Very positive, very encouraging. And I hope that you can capture the spirit of confidence that this verse is to give you. The wedding of the Lamb has come. Now, what kind of a wedding is Christ going to have, do you suppose? Now, let's, let's just imagine a little bit. Fictionalize the thing, because it doesn't say. Is Christ going to come like some people get married, and I certainly don't mean anything bad of you who might have done this, but Christ's not going to throw a ladder up the second floor of the bride's house, middle of the night, climb up the ladder, knock on the door, and together, sneak down, 2 o'clock a.m., rush off to Las Vegas and get married in an elopement. Nobody knows about it. Family doesn't share in it. Write a letter back home to mom and dad, say, well, we decided to get married last night. Christ's not going to elope, sneak off, secretly go away somewhere. Christ isn't going to run down to the justice of the peace, take out a $2 marriage license, and have some civic official perform his marriage there, maybe a couple of witnesses they drag off the street. Unfortunately, that's the way some people get married. It's legal. Has been done, I am sure, maybe even in embarrassment. Some of you now reflecting back on your own marriages, that's the way you did it. And that's not the way this wedding is going to be. That's perhaps my opinion, but for what it's worth, I believe this wedding, the marriage of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, to the church who has made herself ready, is going to be one of the most significant events that will ever take place in all eternity. You think of it in your own family, when you have nurtured and reared your children to maturity. And they've taken their place, hopefully old enough, to have had the training and the skills of a profession or an education completed, and it's wedding time. There is probably nothing in the life of any of us more beautiful, more joyful, happier than the wedding of our children. There just seems to be something so very special, especially when it's right and when it's good, and we appreciate the young man that she's marrying or the young lady that our son is marrying. We love the other person and the family of that other person, and it just is so beautiful. There is just nothing like it. And as a minister, especially over the many years being in Ambassador College, I've had the privilege to participate in I don't know how many weddings, but it scores and scores now. I think the ministers who have opportunities in that way have, have really been able to enjoy uh, in June right after graduation or through the summer months or any other time of the year it might occur, but of course they often happen in June because that's when college is out and students graduate from college and get married 
because the parents are all able to be there together and to share in those two momentous events in young people's lives, and it's, it's just nothing like it. The beautiful bride and the music of a wedding, and the bridegroom and his entourage dressed in their tuxedos, and all dignified for the occasion, and when the bride comes down the aisle and everyone turns to, to look, there's, there's just nothing like it. It's the most beautiful thing in life. And fathers who are hard and often kind of unresilient sometimes think are sitting there on that front row after they have dropped their lovely daughter off with tears streaming down their faces. It's the wedding of this beautiful young 21 or 2 or 3 year old daughter that they're now giving away to another man. It's just so beautiful. Do you think God the Father is going to have Christ sneak off back in the universe somewhere and the darkness perform this little wedding ceremony and nobody knows about it and he just sort of appears there? Uh-uh, that's not what this is. The wedding of the Lamb has come and the sound of the angelic voices is like the roaring of rushing water and claps of thunder. This is important to God and to Jesus Christ. And you know, Christ is the bridegroom sitting at the right hand of God right now today. Every day that goes by, he's just that much nearer being married. Now, all you men can identify with this as you've been engaged and that wedding day is right around the corner. It's only a month away and it's two weeks away and then it's a week away and this guy's got a glint in his eye you can't believe for what he's going to be able to enter into life and marriage and his honeymoon and the happiness and to take this beautiful young girl that he's met as his wife and to change her name to his. Why, every bridegroom who has ever walked to the wedding ceremony and watched that beautiful young lady walk down this aisle must at least, I mean, why, why would Christ be any different? You think he's very nonchalantly just sitting up there in heaven? Oh, well, we'll get married one of these days. There she is down there. Kind of ugly. Doesn't say too much. No, that's not the way it ought to be. He said she's been preparing herself. I think if I, I'm, maybe I'm humanizing Christ a little too much here. I don't want to do that. But I sort of see Christ sitting at the right hand of God. And when he thinks about being married and he looks down at his church, he sees what's going to be the most beautiful bride ever. He's probably in his mind's eye, like all young men do. Picture that vision of loveliness. Dressed in white, veiled, but you know what she looks like because you've fallen in love with her and you know her and you see her beauty, internal and external beauty. And I think Christ is sitting in the right hand of God and from time to time the wedding has got to come up. A father and a son are just going to talk about that, aren't they? They're going to talk about the marriage and what it's going to be like and the preparations that are going to be made for it. And they're observing the acts and the preparation of the bride. The bride has made herself ready, it says. Fine linen was given unto her. She's going to wear white. And that's you and that's me. Now, on the other hand, all of you ladies can probably have an identity with something none of us men can quite comprehend or grasp. We only know what it's like to be a bridegroom. We don't know what it's like to be a bride. All you ladies know what it's like to be bride. I think you've got a little bit of edge on us because the analogy carries through that the bride is like the church. And so we take the female part in this analogy that is being drawn for us in the Bible. And you ladies who have prepared for that wedding also know what it's like. And you know the blushing red that you go through and the kind of embarrassment about thinking of the honeymoon and the wedding and the arrangement. You also know some of the frustration of the physical details that need to be arranged and tended to. But I guess they're probably, again, I've talked to many young ladies about it, as well as the young men in the bridegroom side. There is just no experience in life that you can compare to putting on that wedding dress, slipping on, slipping on those satin slippers, and Dad standing there waiting outside, pacing furtively up and down outside the room where the wedding is going to take place, waiting for his daughter. And then she appears. Hey, it's just an expression no man can know. Only you ladies and the beauty of your own wedding can realize what we, the church, will experience in the resurrection in those first moments of time of eternity to be made the bride of Jesus Christ. Maybe sometimes you ladies can help explain that to us men of what we might think about and how we might realize it. But Christ sees the church being made ready, being prepared now for that event. Oh, it is a big event. And it's been being prepared ever since ancient Israel forsook her covenant and left Christ standing there alone. 
But you and I can be so thankful he has not forsaken us. This marriage has been prophesied. It's been prophesied long in advance. Chapter 54 of Isaiah, the prophet saw the time the wedding would take place, kind of buried in obscurity back here, a scripture that unless you kind of really search for it, you may not realize is even in the Bible. I don't imagine Isaiah 54 is just something you pick up and read too often. It's very inspiring. Verse 1 of Isaiah 54. Sing, O barren, barren woman, you who have never born a child. You know, no children were essentially born of that marriage of Israel to Christ in any kind of the analogy. You who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy. You who were never in labor because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. That kind of blends back into the analogy of Sarah, the wife of Abraham. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and to the left, and your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth. Now, this prophecy, again, looks forward to the marriage of Christ to the church. It's talking about back when she was polluted and when she did go astray, and she's now come to repentance but embarrassed, as she properly should be. Embarrassed, disconsolate, humiliated, disgraced that she has done this to this faithful, loving, providing husband of hers. And he's saying to her, in words of encouragement for the wedding, don't fear, the disgrace is over. The shame of your, your, your humiliation is to be forgotten. We won't remember it anymore, and for a time you were almost like a widow, because you see, remember, Christ died. And Israel, at that sense of the word, became a widow. She became a widow. Only this time, you see, it's spiritual Israel. And spiritual Israel has never entered into that covenant of marriage with any other nation. And the church has never prostituted itself, not the true church of the living God. And it had better not. It had better not. And beginning in verse 5, and a sort of an analogy, I think, is kind of a, an oblique love letter. It comes in at a little different angle. It doesn't really get put first person to second person, but rather composed in the third person, but nevertheless Christ's own lovely way of telling his bride how he now feels about her. She's repented. She is in widowhood, but the wedding is now going to take place. And he said, verse 5, your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. The Eternal will call you back as if a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young, only to be rejected, says your God. But of course, she was rejected because of what she did, not because of what he did. For a brief moment, he describes it in this lovely letter to her, for a brief moment, I abandoned you, but with deep compassion I will bring you back. You worry, don't worry about how Christ is going to feel about the church. He loves it. He loves it infinitely. And he loved Israel, too. And had she not rejected him, who knows what she could have become. But I will bring you back with deep compassion. Verse 8, in a surge of anger I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Eternal, your Redeemer. And toward the end of verse 9, So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. I would hope that would mean she would never need rebuking again, because she has the heart this time of total obedience to God. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be moved, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Eternal, who has compassion on you. Beautiful letter, isn't it? I imagine every wife here would like to receive a letter like that. We had a marriage seminar, as a lot of our members down in Denver, not too long back, had 23 couples participate in it. It was really a lovely time. We spent a number of sessions together, and then one weekend we all got together and we rented condominium units up in the mountains, in Estes Park, Colorado, and it was a lovely, lovely autumn weekend just as the color change was starting, and we all went up there and spent a weekend together, spent the Sabbath together and special Sabbath services and meetings up there. But one of the things I asked all of them to do before they got to Estes Park, and some time before they got there, I wanted every husband and every wife to do something he probably or she probably hadn't done for a very long time, 
and that was write each other a very, very lovely love letter. I don't know how many of you have done that, but I would imagine most of us who are married probably just haven't done that. Last love letter I wrote my wife, I was on a baptizing tour in 1960. I had graduated from Ambassador College, and along with Mr. Carl McNair, we traversed the southern part of the United States for ten long weeks. And, of course, all the time I was anxiously awaiting my August wedding to my lovely bride-to-be, and I wrote some very, very, I wouldn't want to read them to you, love letters to my wife during those ten weeks we were apart. And August came, and the tour was over, and I was so glad not to see Carl McNair for a while and to see my lovely bride-to-be for a few days until our wedding, and we entered in a little over 19 years ago now to a lovely and wonderful marriage. I have not written my wife a single love letter since. Not once. It is embarrassing to stand up here and admit that to you. Maybe it'll plant some seeds in your mind. But I ask everybody in, a, in the class to write each other a love letter, and then we had a morning meeting on the Sabbath, and it was just a gorgeous, gorgeous autumn day, just about two or three weeks ago. Uh, I asked everybody just alone to drive off into Rocky Mountain National Park somewhere up on Trail Ridge Road, a most inspiring place, the highest road across the nation, just a few miles away, and just wander out into the tundra and sit on a rock together there and look at a mountain and read your love letters to each other. It really was an inspiring thing for them all. It just was a very moving experience for husbands and wives to do something like that. And then I read, I didn't read this until just a couple of days ago. I mean, I didn't discover this chapter until just a couple of days ago. So I didn't know about it then, but I was reading through this section and uh, I thought of those things. And I, I thought, my, here in the beginning in verse 5 is, is Christ telling us how he feels about us. He has an unfailing love that will never be shaken, and I have tremendous confidence in that. And again, I, what it must be like to be a bride, to have confidence in the love of your husband, to have total confidence in his unfailing love. Very beautiful. Very beautiful. Isaiah 62, just over a few chapters, the same prophet sees more of the wedding. Isaiah 62, verse 1. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her righteousness shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the eternal will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or your name desolate, but you will be called in the Hebrew, Hephzibah, delight. And your land will be called Beulah. Beulah means married. For the Lord will take delight in you, and your land will be married. As a young man marries a maiden, so will your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will God rejoice over you. So you again get a glimpse into the thought process of God and of Christ toward this marriage. Don't take it lightly. When you hear the church is going to marry Jesus Christ, it is a significant event. Now, what about we who are making ourselves ready? What are we doing about it? How are we preparing for the wedding? Have we as a church entered into the preparation for this event like a bride in those last days of preparation for your marriage? You know, that's kind of a frantic time. And she's double, double careful. Everything is going just right. Have the invitations been sent out? Has the hall been arranged? Is the music just right? Does everyone know what he's to do? How about the ushers? Have we rented the tuxedos? Have the bride's dresses, bride's the maid's dresses all been made? Has the cake been decorated? All the details. It's consuming, isn't it? When you enter into a wedding, those last days are consuming. The bride is just a beehive of activity along with her family. Well, Ephesians chapter 5 tells us how the bride has been preparing in an analogy. You know, when we use, read Ephesians 5, usually it seems like we're always reading the spiritual and then deriving the physical example from it for some reason or other. But let's turn that around today. Let's read the physical and draw a spiritual analogy out of it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, where we husbands are told how to love our wives. 
Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We've been reading about that and talking about that, but let's emphasize what he did once again. And remember, when Jesus died, he died not to free himself from the marriage, which he could have done, completely legal. He could have died to free himself from the marriage, but he died to redeem the bride. He died for the remission of her sins, but an atonement could be made for her. Christ loved the church, and he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Now, in a sense, Christ is somewhat responsible for what's happening in the cleansing process of the church. That is, if he sees that it is not ironing out the wrinkles, that the spots and the stains are not being removed, that it isn't holy and without blemish, he's got to direct the activities of his bride-to-be to where she sees she's got to make herself ready. Because remember, we were reading there in Revelation, we'll probably come back to that one more time before we just, just before we finish. The bride has made herself ready. You and I have a responsibility. You and I have a responsibility to be ready, to see that the church is ready. And Mr. Armstrong is devoted now these months, and what will turn into, I hope and pray, years necessary, that God will extend to him the privilege of being the one to give and to prepare the church in this way, to espouse it, as it were, unto Christ, as Paul said in one analogy he used. So you see, we read Ephesians 5 oftentimes, and we read through it, and then we say, now, you see, husbands, this is how you're to love your wife. You are to love her this way, and we often, probably 90% of the time when we read Ephesians 5, we get the physical lesson out of it. But the spiritual lesson is, what is the church to be? Some very high ideals. Some very high ideals. Not a ragamuffin urchin child, but a prepared, intelligent, educated, beautiful, and proper attitude. The church is, verse 26, to be holy. It is to be cleansed with the washing of the water through the word and to present her to himself a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish because Christ will not accept second best from this bride. This bride will have had to be prepared to be the ultimate. She's going to have to live up to the standards he has set. Didn't do it before, and if I can use the word humanizing it, maybe a little more than it should be. We have to be far better than ancient Israel ever could have been in the physical flesh. And she who polluted herself and turned from and rejected that most fantastic husband, we, you and I, are responsible to see to it that Christ has the finest bride possible. There is no way the church could be prepared to spend that eternity with Christ in that marital state any other way. And as Mr. Armstrong has been saying, and let's get right down to brass tacks, brethren, you and I are going to have to see to it that in this church our act is cleaned up. And we've got to right what wrongs have been made. And you and you alone stand responsible to cleaning up what you can in your life. And when a minister of God has to deal with the problems of the flesh and the difficulties that some of us have gone through, I think it helps us all realize how woefully far from being that beautiful, clean, and perfect, without spot or wrinkled bride that Christ will accept and none less than that. And when you know that there are people whose own marriage lives don't even begin to reflect the beauty and the glory that is the wedding of Christ, whose lives are double standard, filled with a certain amount of hypocrisy, and I'm going to lay it on the line. I don't know any of your specific sins or difficulties or problems, but I'm saying if you've got them, you've got to get it straightened up. If you have troubles and if you have difficulties and you're fence-sitting, you better find out where you ought to go and what you ought to do, because this church will be ready for the marriage to Jesus Christ. And God's inspired and inspiring leader 
is doing everything he humanly and possibly can to see to it you are in that mode, that you are operating on that wavelength, and that we cut aside the drifting we might have collectively or even personally and individually been going through. Yes, I know, it's strong words to say, clean it up, straighten it up, stop fooling around, get off the fence. But we've got to say it because, you see, the job of the ministry, the job we have had laid upon us, like it or not, is cry loud and to spare not and to show my people their sins because you had a Savior die for you that your sins could be forgiven. But if you don't repent, if no one will cry out and spare not, you'll go drifting on your own way. Maybe we were, as Mr. Armstrong has analyzed it, rightly so, drifting into materialism, liberalism, and a host of other isms that we've got to shake ourselves along with the shaking that might be done and needed in a proper way through God and through Christ and through his church. But I don't know anything else to do. I'm not saying I've got a corner market on how to be good. I'm not up here with the iron to iron the wrinkles out of your life. I've got to iron them out of my life. I've got to get my act together. I've got to set my ship straight. I've got to set my course. I've got to make up my mind. And as a minister of Jesus Christ, I will do all I can to help you. But you alone can iron out your wrinkles and remove those stains and blemishes. And some people, unfortunately, I feel, are playing church. Playing a little game of church. And they show up with whatever frequency or infrequency and occupy a seat. And they come, and they may feast among us. I hope it's a very small number. But maybe if one person, strong though may I may be speaking, can shape us, as a result of somebody shouting just a little bit loud of how you need to do it and what you need to do and to make yourself say, hey, stop playing games. You want to become part of the most important event that's going to take place in the near future when the resurrected saints marry Christ. You'd better be worthy of being married to Jesus Christ. You'd better be worthy because if you're not, he won't accept you. He's already had one failure. He will not have another. And you are responsible to see to it that it is so. And I hope that you are setting your course. Very important parable Christ gave us in this regard. Chapter 25 of Matthew. Chapter 25 of Matthew. It's a fearful parable to a way. The parable of the virgins. You're all familiar with it. Chapter 25 of Matthew, verse 1. The virgins are the bride, the bride to be in an analogy again. All that time the kingdom of heaven will be, at that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins that took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but they did not take any oil with them. And the wise, however, took oil in their jars along with their lamps, equipped with spirituality. The oil symbolic of God's spirit that flows into us and lights our lamp and gives us the means by which we can iron out those spots and wrinkles that we may all have. The wise took that measure of the Holy Spirit with them. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and he has been very, very patient preparing for this wedding. Very patient indeed. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they became drowsy, and they fell asleep. And at midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamp is going out. No, they replied. They may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. And frantically, they rushed out to try to find the source of strength. They hadn't been straightening up their lives. They'd been asleep. They'd been paying no attention. They drowsed away the time and drifted into this state of unpreparedness. And while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. And the others then finally came later, and they said, Sir, sir, open the door to us. And he came and he said, I tell you the truth. I don't know you. You haven't had contact with me. You haven't been living the way of life my servants had taught. You were playing church. 
you were just playing a little game and you drowsed away your time. And you didn't pray and you didn't study and you didn't know what my word was about. Oh, you were making a, an attempt to act like a Christian. You weren't living it. You hadn't learned about giving, sharing, helping, serving. You hadn't learned about spirituality. You weren't a praying, studying, giving and sharing person. I, I wouldn't marry you. You're a total stranger to me. These wives I have accepted as my bride. I guess everybody who's ever read this parable has often wondered what significance it has The half of them were wise and half of them were foolish. I get a gnarling in the pit of my stomach to think about it. Does it indeed imply that half of those who are called to know the way just don't care enough to prepare to be the bride of Christ? Just don't want to take the effort to conquer the things that are wrong in their lives, to discipline themselves, to be sure that they are a part of a holy, pure, and clean bride worthy of living with Jesus Christ for all eternity. Could it be half of us? I sure hope that's not what the parable means. I hope that the half merely is an illustration just for the effect. I hope it doesn't have prophetic significance. And really, the only prophetic significance it could have is if you and I let it. If you and I let it affect us, if you and I become so fulfillingly part of the half, who drowsily go our way from here on out in the final years of preparation with the guidance and direction of Christ's apostle on earth to prepare this church for that great event. I sure hope you and I can learn that lesson. I really do. The bride is now going to be ready for the final spiritual preparation. Let's return to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19 is really going to be emphasized to you. And I think we'll all well remember after Mr. Armstrong's emphasis of it. Chapter 19 and verse 11 we were discussing a little earlier, we see the picture of Christ returning. Now, what a setting for a wedding. The scene has been set. The seventh trump has sounded, and you all heard something about that, I'm sure, on the Feast of Trumpets a few days ago. This great event has happened, and the scene is now set for this wedding. The trumpet blasts. The heavens are rolled back like a scroll. And in a blazing flash of light, Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, blazing like the sun in its full strength, stands at the right hand of God and straddles a beautiful white horse and a majestic host of angels assemble at the throne of God and the descent to the earth occurs. Blinding flashes of lightning taking place. The world paralyzed from its activity running for rocks and into caves, screaming in fear because they don't know or understand what's happening. What's happening is a wedding is about to take place. A marriage is about to take place. A bridegroom has come prepared for the wedding, blazing in glory and splendor. And he descends to the earth to the resurrected saints who have been there to meet him. And what you hear, verse 6 then, just prior to this time, If it's in time order, just prior to the unfolding of the heavens and the descent of the bridegroom, there was a great multitude of roar, like the roar of rushing waters, verse 6, I'm reading, loud claps of thunder, and the angels of God shouting, Hallelujah! The Lord God Almighty reigns. We all know that. That message is being trumpeted into the minds, into the ears of the peoples who dwell on the earth. And only the church knows the significance of this event. The Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. And you and I, if we have cleaned up our act, and we've ironed out our wrinkles, and we've removed the spots and the stains and the impurities, 
you and I, the spiritual Israel of God, are going to rise to meet him in the air. And before the altar of the great eternal God, he is going to turn to Jesus, the descendant bridegroom, and say to him, Do you, my beloved son, accept this bride who has prepared herself dressed in fine righteousness now to be your eternal wedded wife. And he'll say, Father, I do. And the great God will turn to us. And he'll say to you, spiritually now made whole and clean and pure and beautiful young bride to be, do you accept my son Jesus to be your lawful wedded husband for eternity? And with a trembling voice, you will all in unison say, I do. And to the clashing clap of thunder and the roarous choir of hundreds of millions of angels, you will turn, my faithful brethren, if you make it, and take one first step into eternity to live forever the righteous bride of Jesus. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.